The Power of Solitude According to Zhuangzi, the highest realm of existence is to come alone and go alone. Those who reach this realm are like unparalleled masters who retreat for self-cultivation and emerge invincible. Being alone is about consolidating all your energy to overcome your flaws. It marks the beginning of true strength. Zhuangzi wrote in Journey to the North, The vast and beautiful universe does not speak. The seasons follow clear laws without debate, and all things contain the Tao without showing off. Indeed, the universe and all within it embody the great Tao, silently and effortlessly, unlike restless hearts that prefer constant noise and chaos. In this life, solitude is inevitable. We are born alone and die alone, and though we may gather today, we must part tomorrow. No one can accompany us forever. While interacting with others may alleviate loneliness, it cannot cure it. The more you speak, the emptier you feel. When you stop, loneliness returns. Some matters are better digested alone, as sharing them might turn into mockery. Do not squander your alone time. Only in silence and freedom from fear can one truly understand how to change the world. Some say that only by traversing the desolate Gobi Desert can one find a refreshing spring. Life is a long journey walked alone. Idle talk is no substitute for a serene heart. Being alone allows for self-reflection. Some say crowded gatherings are but assemblies of loneliness. The solitary individual is truly free. In solitude, one discovers their true self and liberates their inner spirit. Those who enjoy socializing are still searching, yet few find a soulmate. The seemingly indifferent loners are actually self-aware, befriending themselves. Solitude gives us time for ourselves and the freedom to do as we please, often bringing comfort and liberty. Pleasers live tiresomely, contorting themselves to others' wills, diminishing their stature. Life is precious, so don't let idle chatter waste your valuable time. True solitude allows one to avoid external interference and maintain inner freedom. Being alone is about self-strengthening. A saying goes, you are either alone or mediocre. All self-reliant individuals must weather storms alone. Don't fear hardship. What doesn't defeat you ultimately strengthens you. Successful people have climbed against the current alone, enduring tough times. Behind every triumph lies pain and tears. Learn to endure solitude and make it a habit like an eagle, rather than flock like sheep seeking safety in numbers. After a period of solitary cultivation, one's spirit becomes steadfast and wisdom is enlightened. Your approach to work then becomes strategic, swift as the wind, steady as a forest, invasive as fire, immovable as a mountain, unpredictable as the night, and thunderous as the storm. Those who walk alone are formidable, rarely facing defeat in life. Being alone is the best way to strengthen oneself. Throughout history, sages have preferred solitude, and the truly strong tend towards solitary journeys. Solitude allows us to observe ourselves, step away from societal hustle, and return to peace. It makes us resilient, independent of others' strength, and uninfluenced by their opinions. So cherish your time alone, be true to yourself, and achieve your own success in this finite lifetime. 2. Jiang Zia. Three Key Life Lessons There's a saying, to be ignorant of Jiang Taigong is to waste your time reading history. Indeed, Jiang Zia is a historical figure. Although he didn't possess the supernatural powers attributed to him in the investiture of the gods, he truly embodies the saying, talent can flourish late in life. If we talk about achieving greatness at an advanced age, Jiang Zia is second to none. In his early years, he faced many hardships and lived in obscurity by the Wei River, unknown to most 
well into his seventies. Yet as the proverb goes, Jiang Taigong fishes and those who are willing will take the bait. At over eighty years old, Jiang Zia met King Wen of Zhu, who was in search of wise talents. This meeting marked the beginning of his significant contributions. He assisted King Wen and his successor, King Wu, achieving great feats that immortalized his name. Jiang Zia's life experience teaches us a valuable lesson. Success is not about timing, but hinges on three critical points. 2.1. The Ability to Endure Solitude The poet Li Bai once famously said, Since ancient times, the wise and the saintly have all embraced solitude. This statement aptly describes Jiang Zia. Following the decline of the Shang dynasty, Jiang Zia retreated to live in seclusion by the Wei River, until, at the age of 80, he was invited by King Wen of Zhou to come down from the mountain. During his period of seclusion, he lived alone for at least two years and four months. To the common eye, Jiang Zia was just an obscure old man, seemingly not very bright, for who else would fish with a straight hook? However, what no one could have guessed was that this seemingly ineffectual old man was actually a person of great patience, a virtue he demonstrated through his fishing. Moreover, he was well versed in literature and military strategies, possessing a vast and varied knowledge. During his years of solitude, although Jiang Zia was alone, he was far from idle. Instead, he continuously recharged himself, preparing for the moment he would emerge from the mountain to make great strides forward. Today, it has been observed that successful individuals often have a better capacity for enduring solitude than those who are not as successful. Those who can withstand solitude usually have a significant goal in mind. They possess lofty ambitions, clear thinking, and in pursuit of their goals, they continually learn and enrich their knowledge. In this way, when opportunities arise, they can fully showcase their talents, seize these chances without hesitation, ascend the stage, and shine. Jiang Zia once stated, only through enduring solitude can we have the capacity to create prosperity and welcome the flourishing of life. 2.2. Foolishly bold, madly driven. Without a touch of folly and madness, no one will recognize your name. Without madness and folly, there's no chance to achieve greatness. This idea originates from the concept of Qi Fu by Xiang Yu, suggesting that to be truly impactful, one must embrace a bit of foolishness and madness. Being foolish here means holding steadfast to your beliefs, striving for what you love, what you do, and the goals you set with relentless diligence. With unwavering focus, your talents will surely resonate. As for why one must be mad, it's about maintaining faith in your dreams and pursuing your own talents because confidence is the ultimate secret to success. There's a profound saying, Everyone chasing a dream has their moments of foolishness and madness, and every successful individual has their own unique brand of craziness. In reality, those who are foolishly mad possess their own convictions, which shield them from the scrutiny of others. Take Xiang Yu, for example. While others used curved hooks for fishing, Tai Gong opted for a straight one. Doesn't that seem foolish? Despite others' laughter and mockery, he remained silent and smiled, because he wasn't fishing for fish, and he believed that the one he was waiting for would surely bite. Isn't that a form of madness? This embodies the notion, Others laugh at me for being too mad. I laugh at them for not seeing through. Therefore, to be a person of impact, one should be three parts fool and seven parts mad. Such individuals are often closest to success. 
2.3, the importance of speaking carefully. Sometimes it's crucial to hold your tongue and choose your words wisely. This famous saying by Jiang Ziyar in the Golden Treasury of Tai Gong advises King Zhou Wu. This piece of wisdom has been passed down through generations, emphasizing the need for caution in speech. Throughout history, successful individuals have placed great importance on the art of speaking, and even Confucius said, Be cautious with your words and keen and intelligent in your actions. The phrase, trouble often starts with words, highlights the dangers of careless speech, which can not only hurt others, but also bring trouble upon oneself. Cultivated individuals refrain from speaking recklessly or without basis. They think before they speak, are mindful, exercise restraint, and avoid being overly talkative or boastful about themselves. Smart people use their minds to speak, not just their mouths. Before engaging in conversation, it's wise to consider carefully what to say, what not to say, when to speak, and how to speak. Remember, every word you utter has the potential to either make or break you. Just as you wouldn't eat indiscriminately, you shouldn't speak without basis. In life, it's essential to avoid sharp and hurtful words, maintain a standard for your attitude, and follow a crucial rule for interacting with others. 3. Haste makes waste. Confucius once said, Do not be overeager for quick results or minor gains. Hasty actions often lead to mistakes. Desiring only small benefits can prevent achieving greater deeds. One cannot blindly pursue speed, nor should one be swayed by immediate profits. Gradual accumulation leads to lasting wealth and success. Patience and steady effort are the cornerstones of achievement. To build up slowly but surely is the best approach. Zixia, a disciple of Confucius, held a local government position and was frustrated by the slow progress of his work. Seeking guidance, he visited Confucius, hoping to find some assistance from his mentor. After hearing Zixia's concerns, Confucius advised, If you have chosen the path of governance, then you must exercise patience. Look to the long term, proceed with steady steps, and do not act hastily for short-term gains. Rushing can not only prevent you from going far, but might also cause you to lose what you currently have. Enlightened by Confucius's words, Zixia returned to his duties with renewed diligence, and no longer sought quick results. In time, he indeed accomplished significant deeds. Most who seek quick success lack a stable, long-term plan and the perseverance to achieve their goals. If you desire lasting prosperity, understand that haste makes waste. Rush decisions are prone to errors. In the Ming Dynasty, a local official known for handling legal cases had a unique approach. Whenever someone came with a complaint, he would tell them to return the next day if the case was not urgent. Over time, people mocked him for being lazy and inattentive. However, they didn't realize that many complainants, driven by momentary anger, would reconsider their actions overnight. This next-day policy allowed both parties time to reflect and provided the official with the opportunity to thoroughly consider each case, thereby avoiding wrongful judgments. By being cautious and not rushing, one can prevent unnecessary mistakes. To make wise decisions, one must first calm the mind, then consider matters carefully. Only then can one act wisely. A long-term perspective reveals greater opportunities. Historically, many have eagerly sought success, but those who plan meticulously, favoring a steady and sure approach, often prevail. Zhuge Liang, choosing seclusion in Longzhong, was not due to a lack of ambition, but rather a deliberate waiting for the right moment and the right person to support in achieving great deads. When Liu Bei sought his assistance, 
Zhuge Liang's three refusals were tests of Liu Bei's patience and respect for talent. Slowness is a form of wisdom. Using calm to control haste is the mark of a true sage. In our complex and busy modern life, we face numerous challenges daily. By stabilizing our minds and maintaining inner calm, we can accurately assess situations and make effective decisions, achieving more with less effort. Icky. 4. The Thorny Grass There are no shortcuts to success that don't involve hard work. Anyone aiming for achievement must put in significant effort, face countless failures, and through these experiences, gain valuable knowledge that paves the way for their future. In a concert, a musician captivated the audience with his exceptional performance skills. After the concert, a music critic approached him to offer praise, calling him a rare genius of the century. The musician responded, Everyone likes to use the word genius to describe my successful performances but they don't realize how much hard work a genius has to put in to earn that reputation. The Law of the Thorny Grass In the African savanna, a type of plant known as thorny grass grows, also referred to as the king of the savanna. However, its growth process is quite different from that of ordinary plants. For the first six months, thorny grass is almost the shortest grass around. Come spring, it starts to shoot up, but it only grows about the length of a hand, appearing very frail and pitiful. It's almost impossible to notice any growth at all. But six months later, with the onset of the rainy season, the thorny grass grows rapidly as if by magic. It grows so quickly that in just a few days, it can reach over two meters tall, forming a wall of grass. The reason for its rapid growth is that in the previous six months, while other plants were hurriedly growing, thorny grass took a different path. It continued to extend its roots deep into the earth. Studies show its roots can reach down to 28 meters. Thanks to these deep roots, thorny grass can absorb a lot of nutrients and water from the soil. This makes it seem like thorny grass grows leisurely, but in reality, it's quietly paving its future, calmly accumulating strength and waiting for the final opportunity, a heavy rain. Thorny grass focuses on inward growth. While other plants sway and catch the eye, thorny grass isn't affected and doesn't compete with others. It concentrates on accumulating for itself and growing steadily. When the heavy rain finally arrives, thorny grass unleashes the strength it has been gathering. It stands tall against the storm, growing against the trend and quickly creating a miraculous scene. Most people only see the rapid growth of thorny grass over a short period, unaware of how deep its roots go, enabling it to grow quickly and withstand storms. The story of the talented musician and the thorny grass both remind us that the success and miracles we admire come from our own efforts. We don't have to worry that our efforts aren't rewarded because every bit of effort is accumulated for the future. The biggest difference between success and failure isn't in IQ or ability, but in perseverance and persistence. The great poet Tagore once said, Light is right in front of you. If you can endure the pain and walk through the darkness, your burden will become a gift and your suffering will light your way. May those pursuing their ideals, no matter the pain they face in life, know how to turn it into a guiding light for their future, illuminating their path ahead. 5. Confucius's Five Essential Principles for Achieving Greatness 5.1. Avoid the temptation of immediate gains to achieve greater success. In the late Qing dynasty, a merchant faced ruin due to business mistakes, needing significant capital to rebuild his enterprise. The only source for such funds at the time was the Jiang family bank. Thus, the merchant approached Ho Shuiyin, the bank's owner, pleading for him to purchase his assets at a below market rate. 
Ho Shui Yin immediately investigated the matter, and understanding the merchant's situation, purchased all his assets at a price even higher than the market value. The merchant was puzzled why Ho Shui Yin didn't exploit the situation for personal gain. Ho Shui Yin, with a smile, assured him, Worry not, I am merely safeguarding these assets for you. You can reclaim them whenever you overcome this hurdle. Thanks to Ho Shuein's timely support, the merchant eventually overcame his difficulties and became a business partner of Ho Shuein. This story illustrates Ho Shuein's wisdom in forgoing short-term profits for a long-term partnership. Failures often result from short-sightedness, focusing on immediate benefits without considering long-term consequences. In contrast, Successful individuals resist temptations and strategically plan their actions to achieve significant accomplishments. 5.2 The gentleman values patience, overlooking the minor details. Can derail major endeavors. On the path to success, the inability to endure minor inconveniences can prevent one from reaching the end of the journey. In 100 BC, Emperor Wu of the Han Dynasty, desiring to mend relations with the Xiongnu, sent Su Wu to lead a delegation of over a hundred followers to the Xiongnu. Upon arrival, Su Wu was tempted by the then Xiongnu ruler, Chan Yu, with wealth and luxuries to betray the Han Dynasty. However, Su Wu firmly refused. Unable to bribe him with material wealth, Chan Yu resorted to imprisoning Su Wu in a dark cell, depriving him of food and water. Yet, this did not break Su W's spirit. He was subsequently exiled to a remote northern region, sentenced to herd sheep until all of them had lambed before he could return home. After enduring many hardships and patiently waiting, Su Wu finally returned to his homeland after more than 15 years of exile. Learning to be patient means mastering control over one's life. A single moment of giving up can lead to a downfall. 5.3. The Importance of Keeping Promises Confucius once said that one must never break a promise. There's a story about a merchant whose boat capsized while crossing a river. Fortunately, he managed to cling to a tree root on the riverbank and shouted for help. Hearing the cries, a fisherman rushed over to help. Seeing the fisherman, the merchant hastily promised, I am the wealthiest merchant in the city of Handan. Save me, and I'll reward you with one hundred tails of gold. However, once safe on shore, the merchant reneged on his promise, denying he ever offered such a reward to the fisherman. He gave the fisherman only ten tails of gold instead. The fisherman reproached the merchant for not keeping his word and demanded the remaining gold. The merchant scornfully replied, You're just a fisherman, unlikely to earn much in your lifetime. Aren't you content with ten tails of gold? With no other recourse, the fisherman left, disappointed. Shortly after, the merchant's boat capsized again at the same spot. This time, despite his cries for help, no one came to his rescue. Eventually, the merchant drowned. The ancients taught us one act of unfaithfulness breeds a thousand doubts. Once trust is lost in times of crisis, one might find themselves without any willing helpers. 5.4. Staying Steadfast Before Making Decisions Think carefully before acting. To achieve greatness, one must possess strong discipline and self-control. It is essential not to act rashly, but rather to consider actions thoroughly beforehand. A successful entrepreneur, when asked about his secret to success, stated, If I'm inebriated at the bar and not in a clear state of mind, I absolutely refuse to sign anything or make easy promises. Similarly in life, we encounter numerous temptations and pitfalls, all waiting for a moment of lowered guard or a mistake. Therefore, mastering oneself, 
is one of the five key differences that set the strong apart. 5.5. The Importance of Ambition for Everyone in 1483, Wang Yangming was studying at a private school in Beijing. One day, he earnestly asked his teacher, What is the most important thing in life? This question was equivalent to asking about the ultimate value of life. The teacher was taken aback, as he had never been posed such a question by any student before. Nonetheless, he quickly responded with certainty, Of course, it is to study hard, pass exams, and become an official. Wang Yangming looked at his teacher seriously and said, I don't think so. After a pause, he continued, I believe the first thing one should learn is to become a virtuous person. It is evident that Wang Yangming exhibited the qualities of a sage from an early age. Later in life, he indeed became a great philosopher, proving that his youthful convictions were not misplaced. Why is ambition important? Because ambition represents a person's will and direction in life. Only with ambition can individuals, despite limited time and resources and the complexities of reality, maintain a firm will, avoid detours, and significantly enhance their ability to achieve their goals. 6. Training Fighting Roosters Zhuangzi once told a story about training fighting roosters. Ji Chang was raising fighting roosters for the king, who was evidently fond of cockfighting and hoped Ji Chang could nurture a champion rooster that could quickly be ready for battle. After ten days had passed, the king inquired, Is my rooster ready for battle? Ji Chang replied, Not yet. This rooster is still too proud and aggressive, always threatening others with its wings spread wide and its eyes fierce, much like lightning. While to the untrained eye, this might seem like the ideal fighting rooster, those well-versed in training these birds would know this isn't the case. Another ten days went by, and the king asked about the rooster again. Ji Chang responded, It's still not ready. Although its aggressive spirit has begun to wane, it reacts impulsively to any provocation from other roosters, eager to fight. So, it's not yet suitable. After yet another ten days, the king inquired, and Ji Chang still said, Not yet. It no longer reacts violently to external stimuli, but resentment still lingers in its eyes. It needs more time. Ten more days passed, and upon the king's inquiry, Ji Chang finally said, Now it's ready. When other roosters make a move or cause a commotion, it pays them no mind. How is it now? It embodies what people often say, as foolish as a wooden rooster. This rooster has been trained to turn inward, embodying the highest virtues. It stands there, and any rooster that lays eyes on it becomes disheartened and flees. Now it's fit for competition. We often think that a rooster fit for competition must be like a valiant warrior, full of fierce energy, strong will, and determined to win at all costs. However, Zhuangzi shows us a higher realm, where the goal is to shed layers of arrogance and channel all inner strength inward. This isn't to say that fighting spirit is unnecessary, but rather that true strength comes from looking inward, focusing on oneself. Only then can one achieve complete virtue, reaching the pinnacle of a fighter's journey, winning not through brute force or technique, but through character. Yeah. 7. Lessons from a Martial Arts Master Most of our happiness or misery depends on our dispositions and not on our circumstances. Martha Washington a ten-year-old boy decided to learn judo despite having lost his left arm in a car accident. He began training with a Japanese judo master. Believing he had been diligently learning and making progress, the boy was puzzled why after three months of training, the master had taught him only one judo move. Finally, running out of patience, the boy asked his master, Master, why have I not learned any other moves? The master replied, 
This is the only move you need to learn. Although he didn't fully understand his master's intention, the boy trusted him and continued his practice. Months later, the master took him to a judo competition. To his surprise, the boy easily won the first two matches. The third match was more challenging, but eventually his opponent grew impatient, allowing the boy to use his one move to win. Still astonished by his own success, he advanced to the finals with confidence. His opponent in the final was larger, stronger, and more experienced. Soon, the boy was being overwhelmed, and the referee, concerned for his safety, suggested ending the match early. But the master insisted, let him continue. As the match resumed, his opponent made a critical mistake by underestimating him and losing vigilance. The boy seized the opportunity, using his one move to throw his opponent to the ground and secure a win, claiming the championship. On their way home, they reviewed every move in each match. It was then that the boy gathered the courage to ask what had been troubling him. Master, how did I win the championship with just one move? You won for two reasons, the master explained. First, you've almost mastered one of the most lethal moves in judo. Second, the only way to counter that move is to grab your left arm, which you do not have. Sometimes, what we consider our greatest weakness can become our strongest asset. Having strengths is beneficial, but turning a weakness into an advantage is truly remarkable. Believe in yourself. You are capable of anything. So, 8. Is seclusion necessary for spiritual practice? Kazuo Inamori, one of Japan's four most renowned entrepreneurs, once said, Work itself is a form of spiritual practice, and the workplace is our dojo. Every task offers an opportunity for spiritual growth. Spiritual practice at work isn't about sitting in solemn meditation or putting on airs of wisdom. It's an act that springs from a deep inner strength. Work holds profound and extensive value and meaning for everyone. Labor can help us overcome desires, refine our character, and cultivate our personalities. Its purpose goes beyond merely trading labor for life's necessities, as this is just a secondary benefit of work. Therefore, immersing oneself fully in daily tasks is crucial, as this is how one achieves the highest level of spiritual practice in character development and mental refinement. Buddha Siddhartha Gautama emphasized that diligence is crucial, being one of the methods to reach enlightenment. Diligence here means putting effort into your work, focusing your mind on the task at hand. In doing so, one should tap into and maximize their inherent potential, thereby fostering personal growth, character development, and an elevation of skill level. Thus, concentrating solely on one's duties, consistently working hard without complacency, and the daily grind can refine your spirit and cultivate a profound character. There's a saying, achieving in your work is not as important as becoming a person who knows how to work. Labor deserves reverence. This is the true essence. Cultivating character, a phrase that might remind people of religious asceticism, actually means loving your job wholeheartedly. Character must be honed through work, implying that philosophy is born from sweat and tears, and character is forged in the crucible of daily labor. Being fully engaged in one's duties, constantly brainstorming and striving to execute, helps appreciate every moment of life. Life is once only. Every day must be lived with utmost seriousness, without squandering a single moment, living sincerely and earnestly to the utmost. This seemingly naive life attitude, if maintained over time, can transform even the most ordinary individual into an extraordinary one. Those who have achieved celebrity status worldwide, leaders in their fields, likely followed this path. 
labor not only generates economic value, but also contributes to humanity's worth. So, why should one withdraw from worldly life? The workplace is the best arena for mental fortification. Working is a form of spiritual practice. Simply dedicating oneself to work daily, nurturing a noble character, can lead to a fulfilling life effortlessly. In this world, there are no dead-end jobs, only people without ambition. An elderly carpenter, over 60, once told his employer he wished to retire to enjoy his twilight years with his family. The employer, reluctant to let him go, repeatedly tried to persuade him otherwise, but the carpenter was resolute. Eventually, the employer asked him to build one last house as a favor. The carpenter agreed, but his heart no longer in his work, chose subpar materials and cut corners, betraying the professional pride that once defined his craftsmanship. Upon completion, the employer handed the keys to the carpenter, saying, This is your house, my gift to you. Shocked, the carpenter realized he had constructed a shoddy home for himself, a sad epitome of his dwindled professional pride. Maintaining professional pride over a short period is easy, but upholding it consistently, treating it as a core professional value, is rare. Professional pride demands that we perform every task with care and precision from start to finish. Ultimately, what you become isn't determined by the hand you're dealt by fate, but by how you play it. The key to playing life's hand well lies in elevating professional dedication and job satisfaction. Especially in today's competitive era, more than ever, we need the fortitude to practice beyond the ordinary, cultivating a strong, energetic inner spirit. Living isn't about seeking pleasure, but a formidable task. We all aspire to be ambitious, yet often find ourselves at a loss in certain situations. Perhaps revisiting the life philosophies you've long understood is in order. They serve as essential nutrients for a healthy mindset. People must stay awake in life. Some live for work, others for dreams, and some continue living to discover their purpose. Being born is a privilege bestowed by the divine, but living requires personal wisdom and courage. Only by setting forth can one achieve ideals and goals. Only through effort can one attain brilliant success. Only by sowing can one reap. Only by pursuing can one experience what it means to live with integrity. By focusing on learning, dedicating oneself to work, practicing spiritual discipline through labor, cultivating a professional spirit in work, actively changing attitudes, and unleashing ever stronger life energy can one achieve a calm and healthy life. 9. The Visionary's Grandeur It's okay not to be the smartest person in the room or the most emotionally intelligent, but what truly matters is having a grand spirit. In plain terms, you might not be the brightest or the best at socializing, but you must possess a noble character. If minor obstacles deter you, or a few negative comments disturb your peace, or if you find yourself harboring resentment towards others without cause, then your spirit is too petty. A person with a grand spirit is bound to achieve great success. Lam Tak Tu, a poet from the Qing dynasty, once penned a couplet. The sea becomes vast by accommodating thousands of rivers, and the towering mountains maintain their majesty by being free of desires. Grandeur isn't innate, but is cultivated through self-improvement, embodying a strong and substantial moral fiber. Wow, wow. 10. The Wise Do not boast about four things. During the Qing dynasty, Truong Trier wrote in Dreams of Shadows that Journey to the West is a book of enlightenment. It seemingly narrates Tang San Zhang's encounters with demons and spirits on his pilgrimage to the western regions to obtain sacred texts. However, it actually interprets the essence of human life. The book suggests that each character and every trial embodies wisdom 
in dealing with others. After reading Journey to the West, we come to understand that those who are truly elevated never boast about these four aspects. This grandeur radiates through one's demeanor, as elegant as the subtle fragrance of orchids, as steadfast as bamboo, and as resilient as plum blossoms blooming in the harsh winter. Fong Mong Long, in his work Tang Kuang Tri Nang Bo, wrote, To be magnanimous towards the petty is the mark of a true gentleman. Such grandeur endows a person with calmness and grace in their actions and interactions. A person of grandeur isn't devoid of desires or emotions, but sees through life's complexities, understands how to interact with others, knows when to advance or retreat, comprehends human nature, and believes in helping themselves and others to accumulate good fortune. Even in the face of immense sorrow, they can still smile, not allowing their inner spirit to be hindered, always maintaining a fresh and nurturing atmosphere within their soul. 10.1. The Perils of Flaunting Wealth As Tang San Zhang and his disciples were passing through a Zen monastery in Quan Am, they were warmly welcomed by the elder Kim Tri, who was impressed by Tang San Zhang's extraordinary demeanor and assumed he must be carrying rare treasures, coming from a prosperous and wealthy country. Tang San Zhang, being a humble man, not only did not possess any treasures, but also would not boast about them, even if he had any. However, Sun Wukong, the Monkey King, was different. Not only did he enjoy showing off, but he also liked stirring up trouble. Seeing the elder's ostentatious behavior, Sun Wukong became irate and urged Tang San Zhang to display the magnificent robe gifted by the Buddha. Tang San Zhang immediately shook his head and said, Disciple, do not compete with others over wealth and status. We have no kin outside, and this could only bring trouble. Despite Tang San Zhang's admonition, Sun Wukong wanted to show off the robe in front of Elder Kim Tree. This only fueled the elder's greed, leading him to devise schemes to harm them and seize the treasure, even summoning a black bear monster, causing much unnecessary trouble. The saying from Tang Yin Mi and Wen goes, a guest does not part with his belongings and wealth should not be openly displayed. Flaunting one's wealth only arouses envy and desire in others, bringing no real benefit. A person of true inner wealth feels no need to show off or prove themselves to the outside world. A similar story is recorded in Shuo Yuan. In the Western Jin dynasty, a wealthy man named Xia Chong loved to display his wealth in unusual ways. Once, Xi Chong and the noble Wang Kai competed to see who was wealthier. Wang Kai had his servants wash dishes with syrup, while Xi Chong used candle wax instead of wood to light fires for cooking. Wang Kai painted walls with red lacquer, while Xu Chong's family used precious pepper seeds for paint. Despite Xu Chong's vast wealth and his victory in this wealth-flaunting contest, it attracted the covetous eyes of those with ulterior motives. Later, when Zhao Wang Sima Lun came to power, his confidant, Sun Tu, long envious of Shi Chong's wealth, falsely accused him of plotting rebellion. Eventually, Shi Chong and his family were executed, and Sun Tu seized their fortune, leading to a tragic end where the man lost his life along with his wealth. It's been said, Ignorance and wealth in the same place make for one's downfall. Satisfying temporary vanity by flaunting wealth is the greatest folly. Flaunting wealth does not earn genuine respect from others, but only exposes the barren spirit of the individual. 10.2 The Virtue of Humility in Showcasing Abilities from the time Sun Wukong became a disciple of the Bodhi Patriarch, he dedicated himself to mastering his skills. Quickly, he learned the art of cloud somersaulting and the 72 transformations. 
Once, while practicing alone, his fellow disciples eagerly urged Sun Wukong to demonstrate his magical powers for their entertainment. Enjoying the spotlight, Sun Wukong obliged, performing feats of cloud riding and shape shifting before the crowd. However, when the Bodhi Patriarch learned of this, he reprimanded Sun Wukong, questioning the need to flaunt his abilities. He warned that showing off could lead to envy and danger, as those who desire your abilities may seek to acquire them by any means, even if it threatens your safety. Despite his master's scolding, Sun Wukong struggled to heed this advice. His penchant for boasting eventually led him to flaunt his powers in front of the Buddha himself during an uproar in the heavenly palace. Failing to recognize that there's always someone greater, his arrogance resulted in his imprisonment beneath the Five Elements Mountain. The Tai Kandan reminds us that true strength often lies in restraint. The eagle stands as if asleep, and the tiger walks as if ill, both hiding their true power to ensure success in their endeavors. Thus, a wise person, though talented, keeps their abilities hidden, saving their strength for when it truly matters. True strength doesn't seek the spotlight, but quietly builds in the shadows, preparing for the moment when it's needed most. Even in the Warring States period, King Qin Wu, despite his unmatched prowess and grand ambitions, met an untimely end due to his inability to resist showcasing his strength. During a display of might in the Chu King's palace, his refusal to heed caution led to his collapse from overexertion, dying at the young age of 23, a time when his potential was just beginning to unfold. As the I Ching advises, a wise person keeps their talents hidden, waiting for the right moment to reveal them. While it's natural to take pride in one's abilities, indiscriminate boasting can invite trouble and diminish one's dignity. It's essential to recognize the power of humility, keeping one's talents discreet and revealing them only when the time is right. 10.3. The Virtue of Modesty in Intelligence Among the disciples, Sha Wu Jing was recognized as the most intelligent. Sha Wu Jing gave the impression of being gentle and honest, yet his thoughts were remarkably sophisticated and he had a profound understanding of interpersonal relationships. Importantly, Wu Jing embodied the principle of humility, never boasting about his intelligence in front of others. He preferred to gain experience quietly, stepping forward to speak only at crucial moments. For instance, in the episode Three Battles with the White Bone Spirit from Journey to the West, when Tang San Zhang was about to punish Sun Wukong, Xia Wu Jing didn't utter a word in plea for mercy, nor did he try to stop Wu Kong from being expelled. His detachment and noble demeanor throughout were evident. Later, when battling the demon Huang Pao and Wu Jing was captured, Zhu Baji had no choice but to thick skinnedly ask for Wu Kong's help. When Wu Kong questioned why Wu Jing hadn't pleaded for his forgiveness earlier, Wu Jing simply responded with the dignified phrase, a gentleman does not dwell on the past. With just a few words, he not only praised Wukong, but also expressed his own regret, smoothly resolving any conflict between them. Wu Jing's ability to assess situations and act appropriately without showing off was why Tang San Zhang trusted and valued him deeply. The saying from the Discussions in the Worldly Philosophy goes, Hide your cleverness behind a look of bewilderment, be wise in the guise of foolishness, conceal your clarity in the midst of confusion, and straighten with a crooked line. The truly intelligent know how to mask their wisdom. Those who constantly display their intelligence often end up achieving nothing. As the old saying goes, the truly capable may appear clumsy, lugging around a basket seemingly without aim. Real intelligence often lies in the ability to feign ignorance at the right moments. 
10.4, not boasting about one's achievements. During the upheaval caused by the Monkey King in heaven, a hundred thousand heavenly soldiers could not subdue him. It was then that the Bodhisattva Guan Yin recommended Erlang Shen to the Jade Emperor. Erlang Shen did not disappoint, and with the aid of the Supreme Old Lord, he successfully captured the Monkey King, earning high regard from the Jade Emperor. However, when the Jade Emperor issued a decree to commend his achievements, Erlang Shen remained composed and humble, attributing the success to Bodhisattva Guan Yin and the Supreme Old Lord, and shared his rewards with his subordinates. After expressing his gratitude to the Jade Emperor, he retired to seclusion at the Yangtze River. Zheng Guofan said, Misfortune comes from one's own actions. Merits should first benefit others. This is the foundation of a career. One must learn to share credit for achievements and take the lead in overcoming difficulties. The lower one's position, the more they tend to protect their own interests. The higher one's position, the more they are willing to let go of personal gains for greater outcomes. Laozi said, To live without possessing, to achieve without claiming credit. Effort without self-praise and achievements without arrogance are marks of true character. Talent may bring arrogance. Profound wisdom is about being unassuming. Success without arrogance and willingness to share achievements pave the way for a broader future. Guiguzi said, The way of the sage is in knowing how to remain unseen. Bodhidharma also reminded the Monkey King, Fame is achieved through enduring hardship daily, while failure often follows complacency. In life, vanity is evil, and humility harbors goodness. Excessive boasting is merely a sign of emptiness. Only by staying discreet can one endure. 11. Embracing Challenges Transforms difficulties into simplicity. This saying is derived from the renowned book V. Hock Nat Thu Ki Tu Chat, abbreviated as V. Hock by Ban Don Thuk of the Qing Dynasty. The original phrase is, is there a distinction between difficulty and ease in the matters of the world? If one is willing to undertake them, then what is difficult becomes easy. If one refuses, then even the easy becomes difficult. Ban Dern Thuk illustrates this point with a story. In a remote region of Shu, there were two monks, one poor and the other wealthy. The poor monk said to the wealthy one, I wish to go to the southern sea, what do you think? The wealthy monk responded, What means do you have for such a journey? The poor monk replied, I only need a bottle and a bowl. The wealthy monk retorted, For many years I have wanted to hire a boat to sail downstream there but never succeeded. How do you propose to go? A year later, the poor monk returned from the southern sea and shared his experiences with the wealthy monk, who was visibly ashamed. The southern sea was thousands of miles from where Shu, yet the poor monk managed to reach it, while the wealthy monk did not. It goes to show that a person with a determined spirit in pursuit of enlightenment can achieve what even a wealthy monk in distant Shu could not. 12. Lessons on Arrogance in Eastern and Western Cultures Individuals with an arrogant disposition often rely on their perceived superiority, be it material or intellectual, placing themselves above others, sometimes without even realizing it. However, when this arrogance grows, it can become dangerously harmful. During the spring and autumn period, there was a year when the state of Qi experienced a severe famine, resulting in countless deaths. Qiem Zhao, a wealthy man at the time, decided to act out of goodwill and cook meals to distribute to the poor. Day by day, People from all around came to receive Kiem Niao's meals, showering him with thanks and praise for his generosity. Gradually, this led him to become increasingly self-satisfied, arrogant, 
and dismissive of others. One day, Kim Zhao encountered a man who had been starving for a long time, wandering on the road. In a condescending tone, he said, You there? Come and eat. Unexpectedly, the man glared at Kim Zhao and responded with dignity, It is precisely because I refuse to accept food from someone with an attitude like yours that I have ended up in this state. After saying this, the man walked away and eventually died of starvation. It was then that Kiem Ngao regretted his actions, realizing that although his intentions were good, his arrogance had inadvertently hurt others' pride, turning a good deed into a negative one. Arrogance not only turns good deeds bad, but is also a fundamental reason for failure. There's a saying, know yourself, know your enemy, and you will win a hundred battles. Arrogant individuals placing themselves at the center not only underestimate those around them, but also their adversaries. Hang Vu lost his empire, and Quan Vu lost Jingzhou, both due to their failure to recognize their own limitations and those of their opponents. Arrogance can also lead to prejudice, a dangerous mindset, as it causes one to only believe in their own experiences and perceptions, dismissing anything outside their understanding. This narrow-minded view of the world, despite being proud of one's supposed superior intellect, is akin to a frog in a well. We all know that in Western religions, the devils mentioned are often fallen gods, with their downfall primarily due to arrogance. Lucifer, initially a perfect being beside God, fell due to his immense pride and belief in his own abilities, disobeying God and ultimately leading a rebellion in heaven. Cast down to earth, his arrogance prevented him from repenting, continuing to wreak havoc on humanity and becoming the devil Satan. Similarly, in Buddhism, there's a story about Devadatta, a cousin of Buddha Shakyamuni. Despite following the Buddha for many years, Devadatta's arrogance led him to commit various sins. His arrogance even made him look down upon the Buddha, leaving the monastic community to learn dark arts elsewhere, and upon returning, attempted to harm the Buddha and take over the leadership of the monastic community. The Buddha spoke of five heinous crimes that lead to hell, and Devadatta, arrogant and cruel, committed all five. Thus, despite being a follower of the Buddha, he not only failed to achieve enlightenment, but also fell into hell. Perhaps it's because of such profound lessons that both Christianity and Buddhism, as well as other religions and cultures from the East and West, regard arrogance as the root of many evils. Christianity identifies the seven deadly sins that lead to humanity's downfall as pride, envy, wrath, sloth, greed, gluttony, and lust. The Buddhist Avatamsaka Sutra, on the other hand, considers the three major obstacles to spiritual practice to be arrogance, jealousy, and desire, showing that true religions view arrogance as the origin of sin. Conclusion The Tao Te Ching teaches, The highest good is like water. Water benefits all things without contention. Similarly, truly good people are like water, embracing everyone. The sea is the king of a hundred rivers because it lies below them, accepting their flow. Only by being humble, treating others with kindness and placing oneself behind others without arrogance or pride, can one control oneself and earn respect from everyone. And only by shedding personal biases can one observe the world with rational eyes, see the essence of things, and achieve a high level of wisdom, knowing oneself and others, and becoming invincible. 13. The Virtue of Humility Hong Yingming, from the Ming Dynasty, once said, Those who maintain harmony will naturally be blessed. Handling matters with harmony, maintaining peaceful relations, and avoiding unnecessary debates can win the hearts of many and improve relationships. 
This approach can lead to success as things tend to smoothly fall into place. Mencius also stated, The right moment is less significant than the advantage of the land, which in turn is less significant than unity among people. Harmony is about having a tolerant heart, a spirit of cooperation, an understanding of teamwork, and fostering a congenial atmosphere. Harmony is not just an outward expression, but also an inner cultivation. Only those who embody harmony can effectively communicate and collaborate with others, leading to professional success. A harmonious person possesses the virtue to support all things. With good moral conduct, success follows in all endeavors. Those who are harmonious know to forgive and accommodate others, share credit for achievements, take responsibility for mistakes, and know when to be flexible. Having a heart that forgives the fallen and values the path of the successful ensures fairness and kindness in all dealings. A harmonious person is enthusiastic, not indifferent, loyal, not insincere. They give genuinely without expecting anything in return, avoiding boasting or exploiting others for personal gain. They believe in the principle that a noble person remains calm in heart, while the petty are easily disturbed, promoting integrity and simplicity in their conduct. 14. Embracing challenges with determination and resilience. Without a sense of purpose, success remains elusive. With determination, all endeavors can flourish. Confucius once stated, an army can survive without its general, but a man cannot thrive without a sense of purpose. Having a clear goal is what defines determination. The energy and spirit to pursue that goal relentlessly is resilience, and together they form the essence of perseverance. True perseverance without strength is not the pinnacle of wisdom. Every career success hinges on this very principle. When faced with adversity or humiliation, if one's purpose remains unshaken and steadfastly pursued, it reveals their true perseverance. Those who endure hardships to fulfill their responsibilities ultimately achieve significant accomplishments. The historian Sima Qian exemplified extreme patience, enduring suffering and disgrace to establish his legacy, leaving behind the renowned Records of the Grand Historian. His embodiment of endurance elevated the concept to its highest form. The pain of humiliation and the challenge of patience laid the foundation for the creation of this monumental work. 15. The Scholarly Aura of Reading in Free Time The term scholarly aura refers to a distinguished and elegant demeanor, an external manifestation of an admirable inner quality. This aura is like a fresh breeze emanating from the scent of books, capable of refining thoughts and actions alike. A person with a scholarly aura shines brighter in the presence of books, and the reading room becomes a crucial space for nurturing this scholarly demeanor. In the reading room, books are companions and friends. Immersing oneself in a sea of books and engaging with the learned, one acquires a wealth of knowledge, making the reading room the perfect place to cultivate a scholarly aura. The ancients said, effort is made in the open, suggesting that to develop a scholarly aura, one should not confine themselves to the reading room, but explore the world. Engage with wise individuals and immerse yourself in nature. The rich tapestry of social life is a grand book in itself. Stepping outside the reading room to embrace the world's natural rhythm can enrich one's scholarly aura with the pure essence of the earth and sky. Tang Kwok Fien once stated, A person's demeanor is innate and hard to change, but reading books can transform it. To maintain one's finest qualities throughout life, one must continuously cultivate a scholarly aura, allowing it to fill the heart and permeate every space, resonating endlessly. 
The scholarly aura also has a characteristic of deep accumulation before gradually manifesting, and only through cultivation can one amass it in abundance. Nurturing a scholarly demeanor is not a matter of days, but a lifelong endeavor. 16. The Story of Building the Brooklyn Bridge The Brooklyn Bridge, spanning the river between the cities of Manhattan and Brooklyn, is truly a marvel of construction. In 1883, an innovative engineer named John Roebling was filled with enthusiasm at the idea of building a spectacular bridge connecting these two cities. However, when he presented his bold concept, not a single civil engineer was willing to collaborate with him. They thought he was crazy and told him to forget about it, claiming such a bridge could not be built. Undeterred, Roebling went home and convinced his son Washington, a promising engineer himself, that the bridge could indeed be constructed. Together, they shared a dream of completing the bridge and discussed ways to overcome the numerous obstacles. Eventually, Banks believed in them and agreed to fund the project. Excited and passionate, they hired workers and began constructing the bridge of their dreams. A few months into the project, disaster struck. An accident at the construction site claimed the life of John Roebling and severely injured his son, Washington's head. After the accident, Washington was left unable to walk or speak. Everyone thought the project would ultimately dissipate into thin air, as only the Roeblings truly understood how to build this bridge. Despite his inability to move or speak, Washington Roebling's mind remained sharp. One day, lying in the hospital, he devised a way to communicate with others. The only movement he could control was the twitch of one finger, and with this, he invented a communication code. Using this code, he would tap out his thoughts onto his wife's arm to convey what needed to be said to the engineers who continued the construction of the bridge. For 13 years, Washington directed the construction with the only moving finger he had until the magnificent Brooklyn Bridge we see today was completed. 17. Maturing What does it mean to mature? Is it graying hair, weathered skin, or the wrinkles at the corners of our eyes? No, it's none of these. The changing outer appearance is merely the passage of time's footprint. True maturity never reveals itself so easily. Perhaps maturity is like a ripe peach, soft and sweet to the taste. We often believe that as we age, our souls mature and ripen, but that's not necessarily true. Maturity is like a cycle of life experiences over the years, the calm after longing unfulfilled, the smile after tears of hardship, the inner drive to rise after crushing defeats. True maturity has never been about age nor bound by time, but lies in the tranquility and peace within. Maturity is like the moon shining through the clouds, a dragon soaring through the storm, akin to being at one with the earth and mud, resembling a fish that swims upstream with the wind. During the Northern Song dynasty, there was a great poet named Su Shi, who, despite the tumults of life, maintained his composure and joy in adversity. Su Shi, known for his integrity and straightforwardness, was demoted for criticizing the salt tax policy of Wang Anxi and was sent to Huangzhou. In Huangzhou, living in a simple room by the river with little money or food, Su Shi took to farming himself. Yet faced with life's dire straits, Su Shi never lost his demeanor. He was never brought low by money. Su Shi lived happily in his small riverside home. In Huangzhou, he led a simple life, reading, composing poetry, painting, practicing calligraphy, building his house, growing vegetables, digging wells, plowing fields, and enjoying the pastoral life. Despite growing disillusioned with his long exile, he fell in love with this desolate land and devoted nearly all his time 
to creating poetry and paintings. His character earned him great admiration in later generations. If growing up is like trees flowering, then maturing is like the fruiting process. From seedlings to blossoming flowers, each tree undergoes growth and development. But not every bloom will bear fruit, just as not every increase in age brings maturity. Maturity is a state of being, like finding one's light in the darkest skies. When fog obscures the path, the mature mind knows to slow down, reflect, and wait calmly amidst the stormy seas for the right moment. The mature understand that everyone has a purpose. They recognize that people are more complex than they appear on the surface, each with their unique strengths and weaknesses. With maturity comes the realization that life requires forgiveness of oneself and others, even enemies. The sea accepts a hundred rivers. Its greatness comes from its capacity to encompass. Forgiving others' faults is also freeing oneself. Life is fleeting. From green to gray hair in an instant, the mature heart does not dwell on transient gains or losses. The stronger the wind, the calmer the heart, the heavier the rain, the more steadfast the will. Age is seen on the surface, but maturity lies within. The mature possess a serene spirit. Maturity is like a river swelling quietly at night, outwardly calm, but inwardly gathering immense strength, capable of cleansing all. If everyone has a halo, the matures would surely be white, bright, yet not blinding, splendid without ostentation, vibrant, but not disruptive. A mature heart is like water, gentle yet resilient, letting joys and sorrows pass without leaving a mark. Maturity is not about age, but about inner peace and tranquility, unshaken by the world's changes, steadfast as a mountain. Maturation is a personal requirement and refinement, an experiment and reflection on oneself and a state of being. On the journey to maturity, everyone goes through much and learns much. No matter how long or thorny the path, each step that makes us more mature is a success. 18. Not getting lost in past glories. It's often said that dwelling on a glorious past is the biggest obstacle to future success. Everyone has a past, a time when they were at their peak, but after all, it's just that, the past. Yet many fail to grasp this, choosing instead to define their present lives by what once was. They look at others whose pasts seemed less impressive, but who are now faring much better, and instead of striving to catch up, they feel an unfairness. How could someone who was once so down on their luck be thriving now? As others steadily move forward, these individuals cling to the past, believing themselves to be wise, yet they only fall further behind, their lives becoming increasingly stagnant. Those engulfed in their former splendor, unwilling to let go, will find themselves thinking, they are the talented ones who just haven't found their moment, blaming life for deliberately placing hurdles in their path. This breeds resentment and dissatisfaction, making everything seem disagreeable. Yesterday cannot stay, neither can past glories. If one doesn't dwell on what was, they won't halt their progress, won't harbor dissatisfaction with life, allowing for a journey that steadily improves and enriches. Mom.